So thank you to, again, to Dr. Dugan and uh, the Mershon Center for International Security Studies for allowing me to present today. Um, again, I'm Andrew Mackey, a doctoral student at Creighton. Uh, before uh, getting into my doctoral program, I previously worked in communications and lobbying, uh, most recently as the associate director for the Catholic Conference in uh, Columbus, Ohio, which is the uh, lobbying firm for the Catholic bishops of the state of Ohio. So my paper focuses on the dangers posed by religious lobbying uh, groups in terms of promoting uh, Christian nationalism within state legislatures. And I'll start with my definitions and sort of my rules as I lay this out. Uh, so my definition of uh, Christian nationalism is defined by Perry, Whitehead, Grubbs, and Baker in 2021. And it's a form of religious nationalism that is closely associated with Christianity. Uh, it plays a significant role in shaping the internal politics of societies, and it does that by pushing for a civil uh, and criminal law that mirrors their interpretation of Christianity and its role in political and social life. And this movement seeks to legislate based on that Christian worldview, and it can affect the very fabric of democratic and pluralistic society. Uh, Gorski and Perry also said in 2012 or 2022 that Christian nationalists advocate for America to be a Christian nation or at the very least one that's governed by Christians. And this belief system stands apart from evangelicalism or even patriotism. Uh, and it underscores the need that not all Christians uh, align with Christian nationalist ideologies. And I would like to make that perfectly clear, uh, speaking not only for myself as a Christian, but for many others out there. Uh, and as I delve into the topic, I want to emphasize that my discussion will not be questioning the sincerity or devoutness of any individuals who do identify as Christians. Um, as part of my definition, if somebody calls themselves a Christian, I'm going to take them at their word uh, and understand that it is a broad spectrum. It's a wide spectrum in terms of how people choose to worship uh, and how they worship. It's a deep tradition of advocacy. Uh, it has many denominations, many individuals, and it cannot be covered uh, in in this sort of disclaimer. So just know if you call yourself a Christian for the purposes of this or an acting in a way that seeks to promote that, um, I'm going to take you at your word. So uh, I also draw from the work of Perry, Whitehead, Grubbs, Baker, and Gorski, kind of combining everything uh, to say that this definition is further identified by its drive to enact these sort of anti-pluralistic legislation and policies. Uh, and that legislation is grounded in that Christian worldview. So the focus today is understanding the implications of this, uh, what this movement looks like, how it affects state legislatures, uh, and by extension, society for believers and non-believers. So one of the interesting things is that uh, Christian nationalists are using uh, state legislatures to sort of push this agenda of uh, religious freedom, church state separation, and many rights uh, and freedoms that depend on them. And in 2023, we actually saw it was the most intense year for state legislatures for anti-LGBTQ, anti-trans legislation across the United States. Um, and as of March of 2024, uh, I believe Annalise mentioned this yesterday in her presentation, there have been 479 bills uh, that have been introduced across state legislatures across the United States. Uh, these include athlete bans, curriculum and censorship bills, uh, book bans, bans of gender affirming care, uh, bills that create narrow definitions of sex, uh, parents' bills of rights, and we're starting to see a resurgence again of bathroom bills. Uh, and this increase has been steadily occurring since 2015, uh, when we saw the opposition to same-sex marriage uh, as was overturned, uh, and it was moved into legislation, uh, sort of pushing these avenues. Uh, this is not a grassroots uprising. It is manufactured nationally by think tanks and organizations. Um, yesterday, Dr. Dugan and, and Jack Whipple mentioned ALEC, um, the Heritage Foundation, the Alliance Defending Freedom, and the American Principles Project. And I have these photos here. Uh, this is Josh Hawley speaking at an American Principles Project event. Um, his wife is counsel at the Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, and Matt Sharp down below is, serves, uh, he actually testifies often in Ohio um, on behalf of, of different bills. Um, and here you can see him testifying in November 2023. So it's national groups, but they're also, they're also done at local levels. And in Ohio, we can see that this work is done specifically by the organization called the Center for Christian Virtue. And the Center for Christian Virtue actively lobbies for this style of legislation. And in many cases, they write it sort of like Alec does. They 
Um, they use communication strategies such as signaling and framing and intense rhetoric to sort of prey upon misunderstanding uh, and sort of promote high control legislation. And it's not a very ecumenical understanding of Christian worldviews or teaching. It does trend towards a very uh, patriarchal conservative understanding of Christianity. And as the United States I mean, actually, this is some a great reporting, too, that's been done by local state house folks related to um, Center for Christian Virtue working in, quote, basically working with legislators to help uh, craft that legislation and language. They were able to obtain uh, dialogue back and forth between their lobbyists and state legislators to make sure the language is right, and then also including some of these larger firms. So I want to make sure I shout that out as well, too. Um, local state house cores are, are doing the best work in, in terms of, of keeping their eye on this thing. And they've been doing it for a long time. But um, as the United States sort of demographics change and it becomes less white and more secular, we're starting to see leaders begin to push for a societal change in the workplace and in other spheres of influence. And what they're using is something called the Seven Mountain Mandate. And you might have heard this recently with some mainstream figures who have kind of spoken out about how they're proponents of it. It's a dominionist conservative Christian movement. Um, in public spa statements, many elected officials, candidates, and political influencers, such as uh, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, uh, Turning Point USA's Charlie Kirk, U.S. Representative Lowen Boebert, and Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court Tom Parker have all said at some point in the last few years that they are proponents of this seven, uh, seven mountain mandate. And seven mountain mandate holds that there are seven aspects of American society or society in general that believers should seek to influence. Um, and this includes family, religion, education, media, uh, entertainment, business, and government. Uh, and it's on it's it's you want to understand the appeal to Christians in the Seven Mountain Mandate because it shows how these ideas sort of, you know, uh, can influence legislation and even interactions that you see. Um, this was sort of an understanding here of uh, some of the language that people have used related to it. Bobert has said that she's tired of the separation of church and state junk while at a church. Um, the Alabama Supreme Court chief recently, just recently after their ruling, uh, was talking about this on a podcast. And Mike Johnson, they've done a lot of extensive uh, pieces about him. But the the 7 ma uh, seven m mandate uh, sort of holds that these are important avenues for Christians to sort of pursue influence in. And so we look at that, uh, once again, you sort of think about all the different areas that this touches. And it's it was created by Dr. Lance Walno and Bill Johnson. They coined the term Seven Mountain Mandate. Uh, they wrote a book called Invading Babylon, uh, the Seven Mountain Mandate. And it adapted this missionary mandate from Christ uh, to his disciples to go and make disciples uh, to all the nations into a mandate of societal transformation. And it's a typical call of evangelism among churchgoers. I worked in a diocesan office of evangelization, and I'm a churchgoer, and hearing this call is not uncommon. It's not radical. It's sort of the idea of how you're supposed to be a Christian in the world. Um, but the authors reason that since churches already have a presence uh, in all these nations, they should concentrate on influencing the other systems or the mountains within those nations and not just to win over souls. And according to Walno, is that Christians are not currently influenced society outside of the church. And to fix that society, they have to dominate. Uh, and he's a prominent speaker. He's a business consultant. You can see here that he has on his website this podcast that sort of touches the line. Um, Cracking the Code is talking about voting machines. Uh, the Path to Prosperity talks about prosperity gospel. Uh, you know, there's a lot of self-help. There's a lot of the stories of Thanksgiving. He also heads into some other areas that you can see, too. Um, there's a lot of us versus them narratives. Um, Charlie Kirk and him talked about the multi-million dollar attack on Christians. Uh, they talked about collusion against Trump from government FBI. Was the FBI behind January 6th? So you sort of see this sprinkled in with sort of this, this spiritual care. Um, and so you start to wonder, you see all this, this is sort of the understanding of people who feel that their worldview and society is being attacked. Um, and you start to wonder, how did that look into state governments? So enter the Christian Center for Christian Virtue in Columbus. So in Ohio, it was founded in 1983 as, as Citizens for Community Values. Uh, the group known as CCV was created to uh, as an anti-pornography group in Cincinnati. Uh, and they sought to lobby the Cincinnati City Council to ban the Playboy channel, 
uh, from local television, and they wanted to also keep adult film films out of rental video stores. In 1990, they came to national uh, attention when they led efforts to charge the Cincinnati Arts Center and its director with obscenity uh, due to a Robert Maplethorpe exhibition being presented. Um, and in 20, uh, 2004, they helped lobby the Ohio State House for the Defense of Marriage Act uh, and the subsequent State Issue 1. Uh, there's been a lot of State Issue 1s in Ohio throughout history. This is just another part of that lineage. Uh, and that banned same-sex marriage along with the, quote, statutory benefits of legal marriage to non-marital relationships, unquote. And that's in relation to the fact that in 2004, there was discussion of civil unions or extending certain benefits to them. In 2016, the organization hired Aaron Baer to be its new president. Uh, and after five years as the vice president for communications at the Center for Arizona Policy uh, and a year with as a policy advisor for the Arizona Attorney General. Uh, in 2021, they rebranded themselves to the Center for Christian Virtue. They also house the Ohio Christian Education Network, which links 170 evangelical and Catholic schools statewide. Uh, it should be noted that they are not the official uh, lobbying group of the Catholic schools. That is the Catholic Conference of Ohio, but they do claim to speak for that. Uh, they are also the Christian Business Partnership, which is sort of a Christian version of the Chamber of Commerce, and the Church Ambassador Network, which is 2,200 churches committed to uh, what they would call, quote, biblical civic engagement, unquote. And so um, there are many lobbying groups and consultants and watchdogs and law firms that are dotted around Ohio's Capitol Square area. Um, and when I worked downtown, we were initially a few streets over from the State House above a gym. Uh, where you would walk through the gift shop and there's these sweaty weightlifters uh, walking, you know, to get to the stairs to go do your work to lobby. Uh, and when I left, we had moved uh, into a different location. But the reason I bring this up is that in 2021, the Center for Christian Virtue acquired uh, 68 Broad Street, Broad Street um, in Columbus for $1.25 million. Uh, and this was sort of the, an idea of their intent to cement their stronghold within the Ohio political discussion. Uh, they also renovated the space to the tune of $3.75 million. It's 15,000 square feet. Uh, and it was envisioned to sort of be this uh, hub for them and all their different affiliates. And it's a physical testament to their expanding influence. They're right across from the State House. Um, in this photo here, you can see their president, Aaron Baer, uh, sort of looking over the State House uh, downtown in Columbus. But it, it's just an initial investment because in 2023, they bought the building next door. Uh, which is 60 East Broad Street. And that was purchased for, um, it's the old Columbus Dispatch Building, not the old, old one, if you're familiar with downtown Columbus, but uh, they purchased this building and they planned another a multi-million dollar renovation of it. Uh, so they bought it for 1.1 million. It's five stories, 30,000 square feet. Uh, and it sort of shows this, this sort of growing influence um, in this organization since uh, the last few years. And Bear articulated their vision for this, quote, from our new location across from the Ohio historic Ohio State House, CCV intends to cover our leaders with prayer and to influence our representatives to do the right thing for the good of our neighbors, our city, and our state. And it sort of underscores their ambition to be at the heart of that discourse. Uh, it leverages the proximity. It's great to just walk across the street. Legislators can come and go. Um, and so that takes us to the beginning of the 135th General Assembly. And the Center for Christian Virtue, uh, issued a press release, like a lot of lobbying firms do, and its president said that Ohio's children are facing a crisis. It's encouraging to see lawmakers prioritizing serving the needs of children by working to provide school choice for all, protect girls' sports, and safeguard parental rights. With this courageous conservative agenda, Ohio can be a leader in protecting life, family, and freedom. And the Center for Christian Virtue looks forward to working with everyone who believes in a bright future for our state and our nation. And with those remarks, they highlighted the five pieces of legislation that they were the most excited about. Uh, there was House Bill 11, which is the backpack bill, which is a universal voucher system in Ohio uh, to allow any person to attend the school of their choice. Um, they can just basically, the idea is that the funding fits in a backpack, they take it wherever that backpack goes. Uh, so it doesn't go to public schools, it can go anywhere. Uh, House Bill 5 is the Save Women's Sports Act, which they say, quote, would preserve the integrity of women's sports by uh, protecting female athletes from having to compete against biological males who have an unfair physical advantage over them, unquote. Uh, House Bill 15, which is the Women's Right to Know Act, quote, would require doctors to inform women, women considering abortion of the harms of the procedure before it is performed, unquote. 
House Bill 8, which is the Parents' Bill of Rights, which would, quote, require public schools to defer to parents when it comes to teaching sexual conduct to students, as well as protect students from being encouraged by school counselors to socially transition as the opposite sex without their parents' knowledge, unquote, and House Bill 12, which sought to restructure the State Board of Education to promote uh, greater efficiency in the decision-making processes that affect Ohio's families, unquote. And you can see here on their website, when you move to advocacy, this is sort of what it looks like. Um, you can take action from all these. This is very common for um, lobbying groups and, and advocacy groups. Um, and you can kind of see the way that they have betrayed this. And some of these bills have been passed and, and some of them recently had a, quite a bit of controversy, which I'll get to in a moment. So the Center for Christian Virtues website also says that they seek the good of our neighbors by advocating for public policy that reflects the truth of the gospel. Uh, its core issues are religious freedom, human dignity, free speech, government transparency, accountability, the right to life, strong families, and educational freedom. Uh, and these mirror very much some of these other groups that you see at the national level, uh, and they work in close concert with them. Uh, and the organization uh, lists its values to this approach as, quote, value people, be positive, be professional, and be thoughtful. And you sort of get the understanding here. However, their communication strategies are characterized by emotional appeals, uh, moral framing, uh, and simplifying complex issues. And they promote access to legislators and major figures uh, as part of that, that uh, thing. They have Tucker Carlson on, they have different you know, national figures come on their podcast. Their new page, The Rundown, uh, is where they put press releases and news, but it really employs this sort of um, emergency rhetoric and political advocacy to really push this idea. Uh, and the strategy aims to mobilize public opinion and legislative support for bills that align with their values. Uh, and so I'm going to move now to some of the Twitter feed of their president, Aaron Baer. So this was right after um, House Bill 68 passed in Ohio, which was related to uh, gender transitioning. Uh, you can see here in the comments, Baer is sort of talking about using language, sterilizing drugs, drugs that cause suicidal ideation, goal that is medically impossible, abusive and wrong. It's not about being loving. It's about being a coward. Uh, you can also see uh, language at the top related to gender care, um, some of the things that he used there. Um, and you can see Christians and other people uh, commenting on this. Um, the comment, too, uh, that he shows in the photos here with the meme language related to why don't suburbanites want to come to the short north, uh, that's taken during Columbus's pride parade. Um, and so that's another a third part of their issues. But they really want to push this uh, tactics by using this simplification, moral framing, provocative language, othering, uh, and trying to create this sense of immediacy and action that they are under siege. Uh, and despite the Republican supermajority in the Ohio legislature, um, when Governor DeWine vetoed House Bill 68, which was called the Enact Ohio Savings Adolescence from Experimentation or SAFE Act, um, DeWine said he did so because he was against uh, gender transition surgeries, but he wanted to gather more information from hospitals, put a stop to pop-up clinics, and work on revisions to the bill to satisfy himself and other lawmakers. Um, the legislature overrode his veto 24 to 8, and then the governor was attacked on Twitter by Bayer for the decision, uh, using a retweet quote from the um, American Civil Liberties Union saying, quote, this is a lesson for Mike DeWine and every other elected official. No matter how much you try to compromise with the left, it's never enough. They want to continue their experimental trans medicine unregulated. We said from the get-go that these EOs, elected officials, were hollow, and now there's no doubt. So you can kind of see the understanding of this language. Uh, Republicans in Ohio do have a supermajority. Um, so it's a lot of more infighting you see. We recently had a House uh, Speaker election at the beginning of the term where the CCV preferred candidate, Derek Marin, um, they had done press releases and, and announced that he would be the Speaker when the time came to vote in the State House uh, Marin was defeated by a coalition of um, breakaway Republicans and every Democrat in the legislation to elect Jason Stevens. There was apparently no understanding of, of legislation swapping or, or anything along that lines, but it does sort of show that that's sort of the issues they're facing in Ohio. It's not coming from opposition parties. It's coming from within their own party. Um, in many parts of the United States, it is this sort of white Christian conservative nationalist voice that's being made to be the loudest in these policy discussions. And even if they're doing it based on sincerely held religious beliefs um, in the Alabama Supreme Court, uh, they had a case that said that frozen embryos at an in vitro fertilization clinic were people. Um, and in a concurring opinion, it didn't just cite jurisprudence or previous law. Uh, a follower of that Seven Mountain Mandate, uh, the Supreme Court Chief Justice Tom Parker cited scripture in his ruling. 
And Parker said that Alabama state code recognizes unborn human life and that destroying it is a affront to God. And in the ruling, he wrote lines like, human life cannot be wrongfully destroyed without incurring the wrath of a holy God. All human beings bear the image of God and their lives cannot be destroyed without effacing its glory. Um, he references John Calvin. He references medieval Catholic philosopher Thomas Aquinas uh, and early Christian theologian Augustine of Hippo as evidence that people were created in God's image. Um, and this is in an actual state um, Supreme Court ruling. So you can read that. And it's in there with other laws referencing Alabama. Um, and so these organizations and their followers and these policy decisions um, become important because it fosters this culture that promotes this specific worldview. Um, and then it pushes for changes that subject millions of Americans and thousands of state residents to something that they may not believe in. Uh, and the underlying message of these groups is that morality is essential to preserving this nation. Uh, and they would call the immorality of America exists through uh, trans athletes participating in high school sports, um, children's hospitals providing gender affirming care, uh, government employees being forced to issue a same sex marriage license, uh, and the availability of LGBTQ plus friendly books and libraries. Um, those will inevitably be the downfall of this country uh, and that these laws are required to save it or save the family or save something. Um, and they found willing partners who are willing to sort of push this idea into policymaking. And those policies aim to restrict freedoms and sort of push back against the held beliefs of pluralism in democracy. It's framed as debate. It's framed as conviction. It's framed as liberty or parental rights. Um, and people are starting to accept and normalize the term Christian nationalist. Um, according to PRRI and the American Values Atlas Index, from 2023, three in 10 Americans state that they qualify as adherents or sympathizers. So that's 30%. Uh, statewide in Ohio, that number is 30%. You can actually go to the Brookings or PRRI Institute and you can see how states break down in that. Uh, what's also interesting is you start to see that a majority of Christian nationalist adherents and sympathizers agree that, quote, there is a storm coming that will soon sweep away the elites in power and restore the rightful leaders. Um, and 20 Nine percent of Americans believe that are rejectors if they don't agree with uh, the ideas of Christian nationalism. And and when we talk about the idea of this, they get very upset. And you sort of see this like this understanding. So this is a photo of Marjorie Taylor Greene on her Instagram, saying that I am a God fearing Christian. I love my our country and its people, and this is why I'm a proud Christian nationalist. Um, and I think it's sort of it's important to understand what this term means. Um, and when people push back on it, you see that there's a lot of uh, rallying to the idea that they are under attack for this viewpoint. Um, the Rob Reiner film is called God and Country. Um, it was kind of a research thing. It's being you know trashed in terms of by people as an assault. Um, you know, Jim Jordan, a congressman in Ohio, is referenced quite a lot that there's this sort of anti-Christian agenda from the FBI. Um, they're rallying behind this with think pieces and articles and sermons and talking heads telling them that despite having the levers of powers in a lot of places like Ohio, they are the ones being um, persecuted. Um, but they're not being persecuted. They're being called to account. Um, and these seemingly benign organizations uh, like the Center for Christian Virtue or the Seven Mountains Mandate, they, they have the specific purpose of promoting this legislation and lobbying the government about these agendas and these beliefs that are very Christian surrounding family, marriage, abortion, education, and law. So thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew.